Bibles, uh, we're going to be in uh, Romans chapter 11. I love to go through the Bible and pick out the, the best chapters. Uh, have you ever done that, or even in your mind? You know, what are the really important chapters of the Bible? A lot of believers or even religious people would say uh, Psalm 23, right? And that's, isn't that a great chapter? I mean, a lot of Christians can quote it from memory. The Lord is my shepherd. That's a, that's a great chapter. Uh, I think of Isaiah 53. That's a great chapter that gives us a preview of the suffering servant of God, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, there's so many Old Testament chapters like that. And, of course, New Testament chapters. Um, it's, it's hard to know where to start. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 the love chapter. Isn't that great? Uh, Hebrews 11, the great, God's great hall of faith. I love that one. Describing the great heroes of uh, the faith in the past. And we could go on and on. You know, I, I'm thinking not a lot of people would choose Romans chapter 11. How many of you, you know, when you think of your f great favorite chapters, Romans 11 just pops into your head? <laughs> Probably not. But I think it should. And for this very reason, it illustrates and I'll say proves the very basis of the dispensational approach to scripture. I would say as much or maybe even more than, than any chapter of the Bible. It just lays it out. What is the real premise of covenant theology? And that is, that the church is really spiritual Israel, that God has put Israel aside and they're gone for good. They're never coming back, all right? Just like the manufacturing jobs in the US, right? They're never coming back. <laughs> well, they're coming back. <laughs> and that's exactly what we find here in Romans chapter 11. Now, we're gonna start in verse one, but I wanna jump ahead to verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. Are they coming back? Well, they're coming back, aren't they? They're coming back full steam when they come back. Romans chapter 11 very clearly lays that out. What's a, what's a major premise of dispensational theology, at least the, the variety that we teach, the, the Pauline dispensationalism, mid-Acts dispensationalism, and that is that the Apostle Paul is God's unique messenger in this dispensation, particularly to the Gentiles. And we find that in Romans chapter 11, verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles. Well, you don't get much more straightforward than that, do you? <laughs> I speak to you Gentiles. <laughs> Are the Gentiles listening? And as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. And we could go on and on, which we're going to, Lord willing, in the, in the next few weeks, to see how Romans 11 lays out the very basic principles and premises of dispensational theology. That Israel has been temporarily set aside. God has turned to the Gentiles for a season. That period will end. God will return to Israel. That's all laid out right here in Romans chapter 11. So I wanted to whet your appetite a little bit for what we'll be seeing in the coming weeks. The first half of Romans chapter 11 follows this theme, and that is the fall of Israel. And we see that taking place and described there uh, pretty much from verses 1 through 12, the fall of Israel. And actually, there's kind of a progression that Paul points out. If you look in verse 11, first they stumble. It says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? And the idea there is uh, they have stumbled, but it's not that they would fall permanently. And that's the, the meaning of the, the verse. And we'll see that when we get there uh, uh, later on. So they stumbled, and then they fell, verse 12. Now if the fall of them. Now the wording is 
kind of interesting here, the grammar. The word stumbled, is, as it sounds, it means to trip, to trip on something. And that's what initiates a fall, right? When you trip on something. Israel tripped on something. Other scripture says they stumbled at what? The stumbling stone, okay? Who's the stumbling stone for Israel? Christ, they, they tripped. But then the word fall is an interesting word. The Greek word is peripatoma. It means to fall alongside. And quite literally, Israel in this present dispensation has fallen right alongside the Gentiles. They've been put in the same boat, so to speak. And then the third <coughs> term that Paul uses in verse 12, he says, and the diminishing of them. Diminishing, as again, as it sounds, means to be made smaller, to be made less. And that's what we find in this dispensation. Israel has been made less prominent, not less important or not less loved by God, but less prominent in God's dealings with mankind. And then down in verse 15, the sort of the final stage of Israel's fall is the casting away, verse 15. And that literally means to sustain a loss. So they tripped, they fell alongside, they diminished, and they were cast away. That's the story of what happened to the nation. In chapter 11, I'm going to give you an outline for the whole chapter, then we're going to go back and, and uh, cover the first of these three sections. There are three main sections in Romans chapter 11. The first is in verses 1 through 10, and that is that the rejection of Israel is only partial. It's only partial. Verses 11 through 32, the rejection of Israel is only temporary. Okay, it's only temporary. And then in verses 33 to 36, we find a wonderful praise and uh, so almost a psalm praising the wisdom of God. So let's look today at the fact that the rejection of Israel is only partial. And uh, that's verses 1 through 10. I'm not going to guarantee that we'll get through all 10 of those verses, but that's, that's what we find in that section. And Paul gives four proofs that the rejection of Israel is only partial. Four proofs. The first is proof from Paul himself. And that's where we jump in now in verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, you'll notice it says, hath God cast away his people in verse 1? And he's, he's saying, no, he hasn't cast them away. And yet in verse 15 he says, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. So which is it, Paul? Has he cast them away or hasn't he cast them away? Well, it's like, it's like we sometimes say, Yes and no. <laughs> and, and that's what Paul is literally saying. It's not a contradiction. He's saying, first of all, no, God has not cast away Israel completely. And he's going to develop that in these, these first few verses. But he has cast them away in a certain sense. And so the context is going to determine whether he's cast them away or not. Now, in this setting... He says in verse 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people? Okay, who are his people? Well, they are the Israelites. And he's simply making the point, he has not completely cast them away as a whole. And he says to the question, has God cast away his people? God forbid. And that's a very strong negative in the original text. Uh, Meganoido, it literally means 
it'd be like we'd say, no, never. God has not completely cast away his people. And then he, he does an interesting thing here to show that God has not just in a blanket way cast away his people. And he starts describing himself. He says in verse 1, For I also am an Israelite. So Paul is making the point, well, if we just in a blanket way say God has cast away his people, Paul is saying, well, that would put me in a bad way, wouldn't it? He says, I'm an Israelite. But then he says, I'm of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, why would he bring that up right here? I believe it's because there was a time when Benjamin, as a tribe, almost disappeared. How many remember that? If you go back in the book of Judges, you'll read about it. Uh, the book of Judges is, is kind of a depressing book to read because it talks about just how apostate Israel became at that time. And it ends with these words, every, there was no king in Israel and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And one of the things that happened was that a terrible, immoral thing took place uh, among the tribe of Benjamin. And the rest of the tribes came against them and almost wiped them out. And they made an agreement that they would not give their daughters to the sons of the Benjamites that were left, because there were very few remaining. And so then they had to come up with a plan to give wives to the Benjamites. So there was a festival in the nearby, uh, basically, pagan village where every year all the girls would come out and dance around this, I don't know if it was dance around the maypole or something along those <laughs> lines. they come and dance around. And the Benjamites were told, uh, everyone can go when they're doing that and catch a wife and take her home. Anybody ever seen Seven uh, Brides for Seven Brothers? Yeah. Okay, kind of like that. <laughs> and so that's what they did to revive the tribe of Benjamin. Now, why does Paul bring this up here? He's simply illustrating the point. Benjamin was the smallest tribe, became even smaller, almost became extinct. And yet Paul was saying, look at me, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> Is God able to preserve his people? Yeah, he can do that. He can do that. And Paul makes a quite a remarkable point of that. The second proof that God has not cast away his people is in verse 2. And that is proof from the character of God. It says, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. That actually uh, is a reference to God knowing in advance that he was going to choose a certain people to be his nation. And we know that was his nation, Israel. So in other words, if God made a choice sometime in the past, even before Israel's formation, that he was going to choose a special nation to become his, really his missionary nation of the Old Testament, and someday in the New Testament too, in the future, Israel will be his missionary nation. God foreknew that. Well, now when God foreknows something, that is a determinate choice. He's going to do it. It's going to happen. And God does that sometimes. He decides something's going to happen and nothing can change it. So again, the second point Paul brings out is God has not cast away his people for good or completely because he foreknew them and he's got a plan for them yet. There's still something they need to accomplish he gives now a third proof that God has not cast away his people, and he gives proof from Elijah's day. Uh, verse 2 continues. What ye not? 
Have ye what ye knotted lately? <laughs> what ye not? What is an older English word. Comes from the Greek word ido, which is the word that means to see or perceive. So he's saying, don't you see it? We would use that expression. We still use that today, right? And that's really what he's saying here. Don't you see? Why you not? Don't you see what scripture saith of Elias? And of course, Elias is Elijah. That's a little confusing to some people. Just the way it comes through when it comes into the Greek and then back out into the English, you kind of lose the J. And you're back. Uh, it, it's, it's Elias, the way it comes across here. Um, what ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, or Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying. Now before we go on and see the point that Paul is making in verse 3, I want to take just a little detour and notice kind of an unusual expression. Now when you say you're making intercession what do, you, what do you mean, first of all? It means you're praying, right? But usually we say, I'm making intercession, what? For someone. But what does this say? Against someone. Has anyone ever made intercession against someone? <laughs> no, don't, you don't, don't tell me about it. <laughs> Especially if it's me. <laughs> usually we intercede for someone. But here, Elijah's interceding against someone. And you know what he's interceding against them concerning is their behavior during that time. Remember uh, that the time of Elijah and Elisha was one of the darkest periods of Israel's history. And he was interceding against them in the sense that he was protesting their wicked behavior. That's the sense in which he was interceding against them. But then he gets to his point in verse 3. And here's what Elijah said. Lord, they have killed thy prophets and digged down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. They have killed thy prophets. I just want to look at a few of these references that Paul is alluding to and even quoting from. First uh, Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19 and verse 10. And you know the context where he goes up in the cave there, uh, verse 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous, or jealous rather, for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. If you go back to a chapter, 1 Kings 18, verses 3 and 4. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So these prophets were under extreme persecution at this time, uh, being chased down and, and put to death. And then also, uh, back in Romans, as he continues to quote there, he says, they have digged down thine altars. Uh, 1 Kings 18 and verse 30. It says, and Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Now, this particular altar, uh, technically there was only one official altar. That was at the temple in Jerusalem. This one was somewhere else. Sometimes altars were built in places where the Lord had appeared. 
Exodus chapter 20, for example. Exodus 20, verse 24. It says, An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, uh, and pe thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. So there God does give Israel permission to put altars at various places where God has made his name or put his name. So apparently this is one of those places. And then he goes on in Romans 11.3, quoting Elijah. He says, and I am left alone. Have you ever felt that way? I am. No one is standing for the message. No one is preaching the truth. It's easy to wallow in self-pity. And sometimes you feel that way, don't you? I am left alone. And then he says in verse 3, And they seek my life. And of course, that's what uh, Jezebel was trying to do. Again, 1 Kings in chapter 19 Verses 1 and 2, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, Let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And, you know, this follows that just amazing victory that Elijah had in the contest with the prophets of Baal. And the end result of that was that all the prophets of Baal at this meeting uh, were killed. And of course, Jezebel then went after Elijah. Again, Paul lays this background to make the point in verse 4 that even Elijah was not alone. Verse 4. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Paul's point is clear. God never abandoned Elijah. And in fact, not only was he not the only one left who was true to God, there were still 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Elijah needed that encouragement. Paul is using this to prove the point that God has not cast away Israel for good. But so far, he has offered proof from himself, from God's character, from Elijah's day, but what about Israel in general now, now that the dispensation of grace was underway? And he makes that point in verses 5 and 6, proof from the present time. Verse 5, even so then at this present time, now, obviously, when Paul wrote that, he was back in the first century. But we're still in the same dispensation that Paul is referring to here. It has not ended yet, and he makes that clear as you go through the rest of the chapter. At this present time. So there's one of those cases where it was the present time when he spoke it, and it's still the present time now. And we can still draw the same conclusion. God has not completely cast away his people at this present time. And he makes this amazing statement in verse 5. Even so then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. We could spend 
the next year <laughs> explaining what the election of grace is all about. And I'll tell you what, there are numerous views of what the election of grace means. I'm going to give you the short version this morning for the sake of time. And we may have to come back and revisit it next week as we pick up. Even so, there remaineth a remnant. Now, the word remnant. Uh, how many of you ladies sew? Okay, when you're done, you have a few little pieces. What do you call those? Remnant. That's the remnants, right? It's usually a very small portion of the whole piece, right? And that's the whole meaning of remnant. And throughout Scripture, you'll find that there has always been, ever since Israel was a nation, there's always been a remnant that was saved, that were, that were true believers. And you can just think your way throughout the Old Testament. It's sometimes a small group. Here there's 7,000. He makes a reference to 7,000 in Elijah's day. I don't know how many people were in Israel at that time, but 7,000 was probably a pretty small number in comparison to the whole. And so there's always been a remnant. I came across... Uh, an interesting passage just in my daily Bible reading the other day, just, just uh, I think it was just yesterday. And that was from Zechariah. And I want to go back there and just illustrate this point from Zechariah. And I want to preface it by saying, God has always made a way for his people Israel to be saved. No matter what else is going on around them, no matter what's happening with the nation, he's always made a way for his people to be saved. Now, we could say in general, God's always made a way for anybody to be saved. Okay, And, I'm not, and that's not the point I'm making. I'm, we're talking about Israel. Has God cast away his people? And God has always made a way. And I came across this passage, and I just found it fascinating. Um, start in verse 7 of Zechariah chapter 11. Here's a little memory device for you. Romans 11, Zechariah 11. Now, I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say that Zechariah 11 somehow predicts the dispensation of grace. Okay, I'm not saying that at all, so don't, don't get that idea. But it makes a point that illustrates what we're talking about, about the remnant of Israel. So, uh, Zechariah 11 and verse 7, it says, And I will feed the flock of slaughter, even you... O poor of the flock. Now remember that expression, O poor of the flock. And I took unto me two staves, or two sticks, the one called beauty and the other I called bands. And I fed the flock. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Then said I, I will not feed you that die, that, that dieth, let it die, and that that is to be cut off, let it be cut off, unless the rest eat every one the flesh of another. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all the people. Now that's a stunning statement. Did that stun any of you? Well, you've probably read it before. God's going to break the covenant he made with his people? His covenant with Israel? Well, that's what it says. I will break the covenant. Verse 11. And it was broken in that day. And so the poor of the flock... And by the way, just think about God's covenant with Israel. And he uses it in the singular. We know that there are many additions and so forth that were added to the covenant. But the fact is, if he says, I've broken the covenant... How now would Israel, even in the Old Testament times, if the covenant has been broken, how would they be saved? How would they approach God? Paul makes the point in Ephesians chapter 2 when he's talking about the dire condition of Gentiles before the dispensation of grace. And one of the points he makes is that they were what? Strangers from the covenants of promise. And because of that, they were without God in the world. 
And without Christ, they had no Messiah. Well, Gentiles never had a Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. We now know that Christ is our Savior, too. <laughs> but the Gentiles were in a bad way because they were strangers from the covenant. And now God says to Israel, I broke the covenant. How then would anyone in Israel come to God? And remember what I said as we turn back to this passage? God has always made a way for his people to be saved. The covenant's broken. And by that, I understand it to mean that it's, it's ineffectual for you, Israel. And, and what did Israel do with regard to the covenant? They had to come, you know, you had the circumcision, you had the sacrifices. And, and these things didn't save them in and of themselves, but they were all things God asked them to do to demonstrate faith. And so if they didn't do it, they've broken the covenant and they're cut off from the people, which means cut off from the people of God and God himself. But look what God did. In verse 11, Zechariah 11, verse 11. And it was broken in that day, the covenant. Not by the people, but by God, all right? Remember what he's talking about here. And it was broken in that day, and so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Somehow, some way, they came to understand that God had broken this covenant and made it, rendered it ineffectual. And the poor of the flock, and by the way, guess who the poor of the flock would be? The remnant. They're the poor of the flock. And remember, these people, ever since the captivity, this Zechariah prophesies after the Babylonian captivity. God says, I've broken this covenant, but the poor of the flock still waited upon me. And knew that it was the word of the Lord. Verse 12. And I said unto them, if ye think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed my price for my price, 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, cast it under the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Now, what does this all foreshadow? And it's more than foreshadow. I mean, this is prophecy here. This is talking about Christ. Christ was the one who was sold for 30 pieces of silver. He was the one that the money was cast to the potter. Remember after Judas betrayed the Lord and he had the money and he, now he felt remorse <laughs> and he cast the money back into the temple and they said, oh, we can't use this money anymore. That's blood money. So they, those hypocrites, <laughs> so they took that money and bought the potter's field, this field of clay to bury strangers in. And by the way, to this day, some cities have a potter's field where those who have no family and no relatives or no one to take care of their final uh, burial, only burial, uh, are laid to rest. Potter's field. And really what you see here is because of Israel's rebellion, God breaks beauty. Beauty is the covenant. Remember that stick, beauty in bands. Breaks it. But there's still that poor of the flock that waited upon me. And what is, and they knew it was the word of the Lord. And what does God reveal? Oh, there's someone coming who's going to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. He'll take care of it. <laughs> He'll handle it for you. And um, we're running out of time. And, you know, I find it just fascinating how many times the Lord gives me my best illustrations just right at the last minute. <laughs> and when I was, uh, yesterday I said I was at this, this uh, power show, festival, right, in Minnow. And uh, over the loudspeaker, it says, uh, in, at 1.30, there will be a gospel singing group at the church. Well, they have a church building on this grounds as well. And I thought, oh, I want to hear that. So I went there, and there's this lovely family from Iowa um, that just did a wonderful concert. Uh, we had to talk to them about uh, next spring. Uh, the Bechtold family. 
and um, they did a large variety of music, a lot of bluegrass and, and a lot of other uh, you know, just good Christian hymns and, and so forth. And uh, the father of the group uh, just gave this wonderful illustration. Uh, <clears throat> he said, you know, the fires that have burned out in California recently um, have destroyed so many buildings and even taken lives. And he said, you know where the safest place is <clears throat> when there's a large fire like that? And he said, the safest place is to go where it's already burned. Okay, well, that's logical. Why would that be? Well, there's no more fuel there, right? It's already been burned. <laughs> and then he made this very simple but eloquent application. Where did God pour out his wrath? Huh? Where did God pour out? Where's the greatest outpouring of God's wrath that has ever taken place? Cross. The cross. Where do you suppose the safest place to go is? The cross. <laughs> Isn't that good? <laughs> That's where God has already poured out the fire and fury of his wrath on his son. Let's go there. No more, no more wrath to be poured out, is there, with respect to our sins. It's already been done. And I just find it fascinating. So many places, even like in the Old Testament, where you wouldn't expect these references. And it's, and it's not crystal clear. The prophets searched what or what manner of time the Spirit of God that was in them signified when they prophesied of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. They didn't, they didn't get all the details, and all the details weren't revealed yet. And yet, isn't it fascinating that even for Israel, the covenant people of God, when God says, I'm breaking that covenant, they're still the poor of the flock that waited upon me. They waited. They knew God would do something. He would take care of it. And what does he reveal? The one who was sold for the price of a slave. He's the one that takes care of it. Isn't that beautiful? That is beauty and the bands. Now the bands goes on to talk about the breaking of Israel and Judah, the two halves of the nation, breaking the beauty and the bands. And that's why in that, under that same principle, why Paul can say, even so in verse 5, then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And uh, Lord willing, next time we'll, we'll expand and explore that, um, of that election of grace. As we close, uh, I want to ask each one of you, have you come to the cross the place where the judgment has already taken care of your sin. And are you finding your safety in the cross? Believe the gospel. Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. Let's pray.